Located in Wiltshire, Stonehenge has for centuries been a mystery. Years ago it would have been larger, and may have been surrounded by at least one other circle of stone pillars. It's estimated to have been built around 300 BC, and is the most iconic and famous prehistoric structure in the world. This age is highly impressive, as the tools of the time were primitive at best, bone and antler tools. It's owned by the Crown, and managed by English Heritage, with the surrounding land being owned and managed by the National Trust. There are many origin stories of these stones, many now drifted into myth and legend. Another name for Stonehenge is Merlin's Stones. Henry of Huntingdon was the first to write of these stones. Around 1130 AD, in his book, History of the English. Soon after, Geoffrey of Monmouth told the first theory of Merlin's stones. According to Geoffrey's History of the Kings of Britain, Merlin advised King Aelius Abrosius to raise an army and capture the stones from Mount Killerhouse in Ireland as a suitable place to bury British kings and princes. The English, led by Uther Pendragon, would then defeat Irish defenders and attempt to pull the stones from the ground, where Merlin simply laughed at their attempts. Merlin then used his own tools, or possibly magic, to pull them out of the ground and transport them all the way back to England. A giant was later added to this tale by Robert Weiss when he translated it to French. The giant brought the stones with him from Africa to Ireland as they had healing properties. This is a popular proposed theory and is expected to have been exaggerated massively over time. During the Anglo-Saxon period and the medieval ages, many people believed in this theory, and it would also explain why so many people are buried around Stonehenge. It would also explain why Stonehenge is so grand looking, because it acted as a royal monument. Uther Pendragon, King Arthur's father, is also apparently buried under Stonehenge. There is another theory, but much less popular, that's based on the Atharian legends. This theory is that King Haggist invited many Celtic warriors to a feast before treacherously killing them. He then built Stonehenge as a burial site for them as he was remorseful for what he'd done. Some believe that the devil brought the stones from a woman in Ireland before wrapping them up and bringing them over to England. The devil then dropped one of these stones into the River Avon before placing the rest on the plains. The devil then shouted, no one will ever find how these stones came here. But then a friar shouted back, that's what you think. The devil then angrily threw one of the stones at the friar, just missing him and then hitting him on the heel. This stone would then go on to be called the heel stone. In 1640, John Aubrey conducted the first academic study into Stonehenge. He himself argued that it was built by the Druids. He also theorised that the site was used for pagan worship. This theory, however, has also been debunked. It was later proven that the Druids only came into existence around 300 BC and used forests for worship, not open fields. In 1655, an English architect called John Webb argued that Stonehenge was built by the Romans as a Roman temple for the god Calius. Other architects around the same time argued that the Danes or the Anglo-Saxons built it. These theories were the most common after the medieval period until proven wrong in the 1900s. These theories were proven wrong when the stones were dated before the Vikings, Anglo-Saxons or Romans entered the British Isles. The next part isn't a theory, but more of a side note that I thought was worth mentioning. That in 1877, Charles Darwin used to study worms at Stonehenge, which was a long fascination of his. Here, he observed that fallen stones had sunk deeper into the ground over time as a result of these worms. This proved that over thousands of years, worms are slowly sinking our ancient structures and are changing the landscape itself. 
Mike Parker Pearson and many others around 1985 theorised that Stonehenge may have been used as a long ritualised funerary procession for treating the dead. Across the River Avon, another stone circle was built in Durrington. This one, however, was made out of timber and may have been used as a part of this tradition. Mike Parker Pearson speculated that the timber was used to represent life and the stone was used to represent death. People may have travelled from life to death across the River Avon. This theory has much support from the cult of the dead who study stone circles and megalithic architecture across the globe. Mike Parker Pearson also suggests that Stonehenge was built as a unification gesture and symbol. Stonehenge could have brought together five great tribes, who all brought with them their own materials. This would explain why Stonehenge uses far-ranging materials that was unusual for the time and would have taken a huge amount of effort. He also theorised that Stonehenge may have acted as a meeting place for these tribes, and the arches themselves represented the doors to different worlds and cultures. Geoffrey Wainwright and Timothy Darville in 2008 theorised that Stonehenge may have been an ancient healing and pilgrimage site. This is because many bodies buried around Stonehenge show evidence of trauma and deformity. The Greek historian Duradicus Cyrillius in the 1st century once said, a magnificent precinct, sacred to Apollo, and a notable spiral temple lies on a large island to the far north, opposite Gaul. This historical account would back up this modern theory. This is because Apollo was recognised as the god of medicine and healing. In 2015, the Australian Lane Kelly speculated that Stonehenge served the purpose of an amorphic centre for recording and receiving knowledge by Neolithic Britons who lacked a written language. She speculated that they could have used Stonehenge to gather much information for geography and navigation, including land management and even farming. They also could have used the site for cultural knowledge on history, politics, genealogy and religion. Everybody's favourite theory, whether they believe it or not, is that aliens built Stonehenge. They theorise that these stones were simply too big for our ancestors to figure out how to move, and they came from way too far away. This does have a ring of truth in it, as we'll explore later in the video. This theory also applies to other structures around the world, such as the pyramids in Egypt, that were built around a thousand years after Stonehenge. The reason aliens built Stonehenge as well as these other structures is not agreed upon, but the most common theory is that they were built as a navigation tool as well as a possible landing area. The most popular theory by far is that Stonehenge was built as a giant astronomical calendar. This is a common theory that many viewers proven simply because of how well Stonehenge is designed. Many times throughout the year, the stones, stars and moon align in amazing ways. The best example of this is the summer solstice that is still celebrated at Stonehenge to this day. On the summer solstice, the sun will arise in perfect position from the hillstone and align perfectly in the middle of the trilophon. The critics of this theory don't simply write this off as a coincidence. Instead, they suggest that this was done purely for aesthetics and not for use of the calendar. We will now move on from theories into what we do know as fact. Stonehenge is expected to have taken around 1,500 years to complete and been added to by many different tribes. Around 3,500 BC, Stonehenge was built in the Salisbury Plains. Those who lived here cleared out the surrounding woods for other stone or wooden structures and burial mounds as far back as 4000 BC. The community who started to build Stonehenge may have lived here over several millennia. This community would have cleared out the forests and the woods creating the Salisbury Plain as we know today. The people of the Mesolithic period erected pine posts near what would be Stonehenge. It's unknown what these posts were used for, but they could have been similar to totem poles, scaffolding or have other practical uses. 
This deforestation over several millennia led to the creation of the Salisbury Plains, which would be the site of Stonehenge. In the 1960s, a large car park was built over these post holes. However, the thousand year old holes can still be seen today. Stonehenge isn't a proper henge, but referred to as a proto henge by experts, as it was made years before most others, and the ground is slightly different from a proper henge, but this is just semantics and not too important. A large bank was dug on the Salisbury Plains and decorated with white chalk that was dug up on the site. This ditch also bridged along the general direction of the sun. A ditch was also dug around 2 metres deep. This cannot be easily seen today as it slowly eroded over time. Inside, 56 holes were dug which could have held up possible timber posts that have since rotted away. These holes are now referred to as the Albury holes as John Albury discovered them in the 1700s. Many timber posts were also placed in the causeway, used for observation sites or as simple guidelines. A stone called the Heel Stone was also placed at this time, and there are signs of another similar stone that has since disappeared. These stones are hard to date, and they may have arrived as late as Phase 3. Mike Parker Pearson and Willem Hawley erected bone fragments from 63 individuals that were buried in the Albury Holes from the years 1920 to 2013. There were around an equal amount of male and females, and there was also a few children. White chalk was used, possibly to identify these as graves, but this was pushed underground with the placing of the blue stones at a later date. Not many artefacts are found at Stonehenge, such as pottery. This is because Stonehenge is a clean site, meaning it was kept as a special place. Not much rustle and bustle happened here, compared to other busier sites. Around 3000 BC, a large amount of wooden posts were added. The ones to the northeast may have served as astronomical measurements, or they may have just been there to guide visitors to the centre. Phase 2 of Stonehenge is the hardest to date, as much of it was made out of wood, which obviously doesn't last long. These wooden posts overlapped, which means they wouldn't have all been placed there at the same time. When trying to make out patterns, it seems like there's a round shape in the centre with a pathway leading to it. Not all these posts were the same size, some were as large as tree trunks. A pottery technique called grooved ware was also used a little during this time, but we don't know what it was for and where it was used. It could have been used for construction, or it could have just been used for simple things such as beakers and drinking. Phase 3 is where the iconic look of Stonehenge starts to form. This is because stones started to be incorporated with the build, with the first stones arriving around 2600 BC, the first of these were the blue stones. These blue stones came all the way from Wales in the Preseli Hills, 150 miles away, and this is for an unknown reason. This would have taken a great deal of effort as only primitive tools were around during this time, and it's still undecided how exactly they were transported. Some theorise that they was moved nearer to the site by a glacier from the Irish Sea. However, there is no evidence for this. Small sandstone blocks may have been used as lintels to painstakingly transport the blocks that weighed more than two tonnes. This would have been done by dragging one sandstone block onto another, lifting it up and then redoing this over and over again. Another way they could have transported them is by rolling them on timber poles. This method has also proven to work as demonstrated in ancient times in China, Japan and India. The reason why the stones came all the way from Wales is another question no one knows the answer to. The stones could have been taken by force, or as an act of tribute. As stated before, they could have also been used as a unifying factor from tribes coming together. Another theory is that these blue stones were originally a part of another stone circle, and that the two stone circles were combined into one. There is some evidence to support this theory, as there was another stone circle in the north of Wales, Warn Morn, near Persili. This site may have also been the home of the altar stone for a short period of time, as patterns of the ground match the heel stone perfectly. They may have also been brought with the migration of a tribe moving into this new area, as the stones were in some way important to them, 
or legitimised their ancestral identity. But why ever the stones were moved, it would have been an incredibly hard journey to make, with enormously heavy stones. The blue stones were placed in a horseshoe pattern, which would have taken a huge amount of effort to pull off. The four station stones and the altar stone were also added around the same time. The duo and trio entrance stones were added, and the entrance itself was made wider. The entrance part of this build was seemingly unfinished. Some of the stones were removed, and some of the holes refilled. Around this time, Dorrington Walls was also built, using the same stones and materials used at Stonehenge. Dorrington Walls was a site filled with many houses for people to live in, but has since been lost to time. It's also unknown why Dorrington Walls was built. It may have been given to people who came to worship, or just the site built for the workers who worked on Stonehenge. Dorrington Walls was also much larger than Stonehenge, and built more like a miniature village. Many animal remains were found at Dorrington Walls, meaning this could have been used for farming. However, many of these animals would come from across the whole of the British Isles, meaning that this could have been part of a wider trading network, or that people were bringing animals with them from long distances, either as a way of sacrifice or just for food. These animals had plenty of meat on their bones when buried, meaning these people could afford to throw it away, which was unheard of during this time period. Around 2600 BC, the enormous Sarsen stones came to Stonehenge from a quarry 15 miles to the north. These would replace the balloon stones, which were either moved into storage or were placed somewhere else during this time. These stones are yet another impressive thing about Stonehenge. They were dressed to last longer and had more toys and tension joints carved into the tops. This was all again done with primitive tools. Other civilizations would not master such techniques for thousands of years in wood, never mind stone. These stones were also prepared with a final vision in mind. When viewed from the ground, they'd have a slightly circular shape. Each side of the stone was also worked differently to add to this effect. 75 sizes and stones were needed to complete this circle fully, and it was fought for many years that this was never completed. This changed, however, in 2013, when a dry summer revealed the patches of grass which corresponded to the location of removed sars and stones. It's unknown where these stones went or why they were removed. There were five trifolons made up of sars and stones, of which only one remains standing to this day. The last of these has also sunk into the ground by a whopping eight feet, with only 22 feet able to be seen from above. Carvings of daggers and axes have been carved into these stones, which were added in the Bronze Age. Around 2600 and 2400 BC, as many as 4000 people would travel to Stonehenge for the midwinter and midsummer festivals. Animals were also brought to be slaughtered here from across the whole of the British Isles, some as far away as the Scottish Highlands. Around the same time, a timber circle was constructed in walking distance away that may have acted as part of these festivals. In the Bronze Age, around 2400 BC, the blue stones made their return, but not in the horseshoe shape. Instead, they were placed within the outer Sarsen stone circle. They may have also been trimmed down, but this is for an unknown reason. Some suggest that these were not the same blue stones, but different ones altogether, and that they yet again came all the way from Wales. There were also timber cuts in both the blue and Sarsen stones, suggesting that they acted as beams for a larger timber or fabric structure. Around 2280 BC, the blue stones were yet again moved. This time they were arranged in a circle between the two rings of Sarsens and in an oval centre in the inner ring. The altar stone may have also been moved upright at this time. Although this would have taken a huge amount of work and effort, Stonehenge Phase 3D was not as fine-tuned as its predecessors. For example, some of the blue stones fell over, over time as they was not properly grounded. In 1930 BC, the northeastern section of the blue stones just introduced were yet again removed, again creating a horseshoe shape with the blue stones. Around 1600 BC, some new holes were dug, these now named X and Y holes. This was the last modification made to Stonehenge by Britain tribes. 
there were 60 of these new X and Y holes that were added. The altar stone may have also been placed back down if it was ever placed upright in the first place, or it may have fallen over time. To date, 2021, only half of these X and Y holes have been excavated. Richard Atkinson suggests that these new holes were used for timber poles, but could have been yet another placeholder for more bluestones. Roman coins and medieval artefacts have been found around Stonehenge, suggesting it was still in use for centuries after its last construction phase. However, no one knows what for. A 17th century Saxon man was excavated from Stonehenge in 1923, suggesting that some people were still being buried here long after the last construction phase. Stonehenge would have either been owned by the Dubonai, Eltabates or Belgi tribe before the Roman invasion and before then many other Britain tribes. It was then owned by Rome, however the Romans had little to do with Stonehenge with virtually no history or reference to it during this time. Once the Romans left, it would again fall under tribal rulership, however Britain at this point was in disarray and again there was little records of Stonehenge. Once the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had formed, it would fall under the ownership of Wessex, with them creating the Ansbury Estate. The Ansbury Estate, in modern times now called the Amsbury Parish, was a royal estate from the early medieval period since the time of King Alfred the Great. It remained part of the Crown's land until around 1140 AD, where it was granted to certain royalists. It passed down through many families, which I'll now go through very quickly. The first of the families to inherit this land were the Salisburys in 1145. It then passed to the Longesby family when William married Ella Salisbury. At this point women couldn't own land so it automatically went to her husband. It then passed to Henry de Lancey who married Margaret Longesby. This again is because women couldn't hold on to the title. The ownership of the title then gets a bit confusing. It was owned by Alice de Lancey who was married to Thomas Plantagenet, who would have normally inherited the land, as he was the male. However, Thomas Plantagenet was considered a traitor to the crown, and the title was forfeited to the crown. Alice de Lancey was betrothed to Thomas Plantagenet when she was nine, by King Edward I. It was agreed on this marriage, that if Alice outlived her husband, the titles would pass on to the crown, which is what ended up happening. So King Edward I may have planned this all along. The title was then given to William Montagu by Edward III. William Montagu was an ardent royalist and helped the king in many ways, notably in the Scottish Wars. It was then passed on to the Neville family when Richard Neville married Alice Montagu. The title then passed to the crown under George Plantagenet when Richard Neville, the kingmaker, died without any sons. The 200,000 acre Ainsbury estate was then gifted to the Duke of Somerset, Sir Edward Seymour, the brother of the Queen, Jane Seymour, by Henry VIII. It then passed down the Seymour family until 1676, when it was then passed by marriage to Thomas Bruce, Earl of Aylesbury. His son Charles Bruce would then sell the land to his cousin Henry Boyle, Lord of Carlton who would in return give it to his nephew, Charles Douglas, Duke of Queensbury. It then passed to his kinsman, Archibald Douglas, who sold it in 1825 to Sir Edmund Archibus. It then stayed in the Archibus family for generations. In 1901, Sir Edmund Archibus enclosed 20 acres around Stonehenge and began to charge for admission. The High Court also approved his right to do so. During the first couple of months of World War I, Sir Edmund's son and heir was killed serving the Grenadier Guards. Then when Edmund himself died, his brother decided to sell the estate. In 1915, Cecil Chubb attended Palace Theatre with instructions from his wife to buy some chairs. But then Stonehenge was put up for auction. He's quoted, while I was in the room, I thought that a Salisbury man ought to buy it, and that's how it was done. The purchase cost him £6,600, or adjusted to 2017's inflation, £392,000. And he later admitted that he was putting his hand up on impulse alone. 
Cecil Chubb remained the owner for three years before gifting Stonehenge, but not the land around it, to Sir Alfred Mond. Sir Alfred Mond was the first commissioner of the works for the Lloyd George Ministry. He received it as a gift on behalf of the nation. This gift was only given with conditions of protecting the public's right to visit Stonehenge. This would lead to English Heritage being left in charge of looking after Stonehenge. English Heritage itself was formerly a part of the British government before becoming a private company in 2015. During World War I, an aerodrome, two main road junctions, cottages and a calf were built near Stonehenge. This was because the land surrounding Stonehenge was not owned by English Heritage. In the 1920s, much of the nation was appalled and fought politically for the modern buildings that had started to edge nearer and nearer to Stonehenge to be halted. This led to the National Trust purchasing the land surrounding Stonehenge in 1928. They did so with donations given to them by the nation. All of the buildings were removed, but the two roads remained as they were vital in connecting traffic. In the 20th century, pagan beliefs were having a revival. This movement is called Neo-Paganism and its followers liked to hold on to the beliefs and traditions of their ancestors. This in turn led to the Neo-Druids, or simply Druidly, becoming a religion or spiritual movement in and around the British Isles. These Druids performed their first ceremony at Stonehenge in 1905. There were 259 Druids, a part of the ancient order of Druids, who faced much discrimination and mockery from onlookers. These Druids also construct new stone circles similar to Stonehenge around the world as a form of worship. Because of traveller festivals, an exclusion zone policy continued for almost 15 years, with visitors unable to visit the stones at times of religious significance, such as the solstices. We'll talk about these travellers later on in the video. Arthur Uther Pendragon is a Druid leader and Green campaigner. He had many legal battles with English Heritage and the National Trust, to attempt to allow Druids into Stonehenge for religious worship. After many failed attempts in British courts, he took the matter overseas. He brought his case to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg to attempt to override British law. However, the European Court sided with the UK government on this case. The following year, the House of Lords declared that the public have a right to assembly on public highways, which allowed for these festivals to take place once more. The irony of this is that the House of Lords weren't actually debating anything to do with Stonehenge. Many Druids are respectful, however others are just there to rave and get high. The Druids are seen by most to have a right to visit Stonehenge for spiritual worship. However, the disrespectful ravers that follow them around ruin it for everybody. During the 70s and the rise of hippie culture, a festival called Stonehenge Free Festival took place. This festival took place between 1972 and 1984 until being stopped by the High Court as they were openly selling illegal drugs and leaving behind much litter, as well as some seeing it as disrespectful to the site. Many of these festival goers were travellers and gypsies who travelled around the United Kingdom partying. Many bands would also play here, similar to other hippie festivals at the time. The police tried many times to stop this festival taking place. However, people would just ignore the police and carry on partying. But in 1985, the police decided to put their foot down. The police blockaded the site to disallow for new age travellers to attend, which led to a violent confrontation known today as the Battle of the Beanfield. There was a convoy of around 150 vehicles loaded with these New Age travellers in 1985, most of them men. Police helicopters caught sight of them right away and trailed them to the site. The police were not legally allowed to hold the convoy until they had reached the blockade. Many working class holiday makers had their holidays interrupted by the police blockade and were forced to turn back. The police claimed that the convoy attempted to bash their way through the blockade. However, the travellers dispute this. The convoy, now stopped by the blockade, decided to go off-road across the field. They destroyed, vandalised and cut down many fences owned by private farmers, and the police began to arrest them. This took place over several hours.
Both police cars and hippie vans were smashed, with travellers allegedly beginning to throw petrol bombs at police, which is when the police called for local reinforcements. It should be noted that the use of petrol bombs is still unproven. There were around 1,300 police and 600 travellers. The travellers claim that the police started clubbing anything they could hit, including pregnant women and children. However, this is also unproven. The travellers carried on through the fields, with police following them on foot and ordering them to stop and get out of the vehicles. The large hippie vans were moving at a crawl because of the muddy fields. To attempt to stop more violence, the police did not attempt to forcibly stop the vehicles. However, they were armed with riot shields and pepper spray that was used on the travellers if they attempted to run away. As always, some police acted less professional than others when making these arrests. As the day went on, the vans continued to roam across the fields, and the police began to forcibly stop them, smashing windows and forcibly entering them once they'd crashed, sunken in the mud, or ran out of fuel. As the police went on, the police got more and more agitated and violent, with some of the travellers getting beaten on the floor as they were arrested. A few of the festival goers also began throwing bricks at the police. The festival goers then attempted to flee through the bean fields. However, most of their vehicles were now stranded in the fields. Those who remained didn't want to leave the site due to their vehicles being their homes, and they wanted to stick together to avoid being arrested and split up. Many also claimed to be injured, but refused to go to hospital for the same reasons. The police would not allow them to leave the site and needed to arrest them. In reality, only a few dozen of the travellers were injured, with as few as 16 going to hospital, while there were eight police who themselves went to hospital. This smashes claims that the police were all violent and that the hippies were all peaceful. However, many of the onlookers sided with the travellers, stating that the police acted overly violent, with 537 of the travellers getting arrested. This is the largest mass arrest since World War II, and possibly in English legal history. Two years later, the Wiltshire police sergeant was found guilty of actual bodily harm as a consequence of injuries occurred by a member of the convoy during the Battle of Beanfield. In 1991, the travellers were awarded £24,000 in damages for false imprisonment, damage to property and wrongful arrest. The Battle of the Beanfield would lead to two important legislations. These are the Public Order Act of 1986 and later the Criminal Justice Act of 1994. This legislation made the traveller's way of life increasingly difficult to sustain. The four mile blockade was maintained after the arrest as many more conflicts continued to take place with festival goers attempting to reach Stonehenge. This was made more complicated as the Druids also wanted to visit Stonehenge to worship. The Druid leader, Arthur Uther Pendragon, was arrested each and every summer solstice between 1985 and 1999 while trying to access Stonehenge. In 1988, 130 were arrested, while in 1989, 260. However, these were much less violent than the Battle of the Beanfield. In 1999, English Heritage granted access to the Druids to Stonehenge on religious grounds. However, this was rescinded when 200 New Age travellers broke into Stonehenge with them. This led to 15 years of turmoil until the restrictions were lifted by the House of Lords. Many festival goers rave, do drugs and leave tons of rubbish behind at Stonehenge to this day, while the Druids attend with them and peacefully worship. There are many songs written about this event that I suggest you go and listen to, and I'll link them in the description below. These are Roy Harper's Back to the Stones, Hawkwind's Confrontation, Solstice's Circles, Ian Dury and Chaz Jackal's Intenerant Child, and Leveller's Battle of the Beanfield. It should be noted that these songs exaggerate the events and may be misleading with many artists simply trying to tie themselves to the event for publicity. Years ago, the public had free reign over Stonehenge, being able to walk up to, touch, and even climb on the stones. 
However, in 1977, the stones were roped off due to serious erosion. From this point onwards, the public were not allowed to touch the stones, but could walk around the monument from a distance. English heritage do allow for access to the stones during the summer and winter solstices, and the spring and autumn equinoxes, as well as for special bookings with locals getting free access. This is not unique to Stonehenge, with many other English heritage sites having the same protections. The two roads built near Stonehenge over time began to become congested, with plans to expand them. These are the A344 to Shrewden on the north side, and the A303 Winterbourne Stroke to the south. However, these expansions were cancelled due to the protection of Stonehenge. The Brown government in 2007 announced a Stonehenge tunnel to combat the congestion without ruining the surrounding sites. Along with these plans accompanied a visitor centre near the Stonehenge, however these were also cancelled. The traffic problem would only get worse over time. In 2009, Her Majesty's government set aside 25 million for a smaller visitor centre to be built near the site, which ended up happening. The visitor centre was designed by Denton Cork and Marshall and opened in 2013. The road tunnel has also not been forgotten about and will probably get built one day. Stonehenge has been a main point of interest for archaeologists since recorded history. The first to do a proper educated study on the site was John Aubrey in 1666. This is shortly after the Enlightenment with William Stukeley and William Cuttingen taking up his mantle afterwards in the 1800s and 1900s respectively. We've already been over their discoveries previously, as they laid the foundation of what we know about Stonehenge today, so we'll now be exploring the more obscure excavations. William Goland oversaw the first major restoration of Stonehenge in 1901. He created a concrete setting for one of the sarsen stones that was in danger of falling, doing so moving it half a metre from its original position. This might seem irrelevant for most of us, however those who find Stonehenge sacred found this to be disrespectful to the site. In 1920, William Hawley would do further restoration work. Finding a bottle of port left in the slaughter stone, left behind by William Cunnington, the most controversial of these restorations was in 1956. Many of the stones were re-erected and set back with concrete bases. Many conspiracy theories followed this restoration, claiming that there was something more sinister going on. These ranged from the original stones being hidden away by the UK government and the stones there now are not the originals, to there's something hidden underneath Stonehenge that the British government didn't want us to know about. Many who find Stonehenge sacred also stated that this restoration ruined the spiritual feeling of the site. In 1993, the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee called the way Stonehenge was presented to the public a national disgrace. English Heritage, to defend themselves, brought out a book called Stonehenge and its Landscape that goes into detail of all the discoveries that were made during these excavations. Many of the facts in this video come from this very book. Many digs still take place in Stonehenge to this date, 2021, by many archaeologists and universities in Britain. The last discovery of making this video was in February 2021. These are a large amount of Neolithic and Bronze Age artefacts that were found in and around the site, while also revealing that the proposed Stonehenge tunnel would go through many Bronze Age graves. Stonehenge remains a famous tourist attraction and is the sixth most visited paid attraction in the UK. With over 1,604,248 visitors in 2019. This is even with capped visitor numbers. Stonehenge is also one of the most famous and iconic attractions in the world and was considered one of the wonders of the world in the Middle Ages. It's also the oldest worldwide recognisable landmark in the world, and today it's considered a British cultural icon. Hope you enjoyed this video, thanks for watching.